Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the key sets of ideas that is absolutely central in Aristotle's metaphysics, in fact, he says, that metaphysics is in large part concerned with understanding these are what we call the four causes, the idea, the reasons why something is or is the way that it is. And Aristotle's account is quite interesting in that he does in fact identify four main types of causes that are distinct from each other, that in his view are not reducible to each other. And the same thing could be a cause in multiple ways for multiple things. So the same thing could be, for example, an efficient cause and also a material cause. But when we're talking about one thing and its relation to another, it will be a cause for its effect in one of these four ways, according to Aristotle. And this is really important because in his view, this is what allows us to understand the why it is things are the way for those things of the entire universe. And it allows us to even extend to thinking about the, the world as a whole or things in general. In the metaphysics, he is not introducing an idea that's totally new for him because he references an earlier work, the physics, and says the four causes are laid out there. Why is he bringing up this, this notion then in the metaphysics? Because metaphysics deals with this and because in his view, all of the predecessors that he is talking about from Thales all the way up to his teacher Plato and everybody in between failed to recognize the importance and distinctiveness of at least one of these causes. So they dealt with them, but sometimes in a less explicit, less articulate, less well thought out manner. And some of them may have only used one or two of these causes to try to explain how things are the way they are, why they've come to be the way they are. Aristotle thinks that this is the totality of the things that can in fact be called causes in general. And this provides in his view, a comprehensive picture of causality. So let's take a look at each one of these in turn, and then think about how they come together. And we'll look at a few examples that he gives as well, either from the physics or from other places in the metaphysics. So we have a thing. We have something that we want to understand. And one of the causes of the thing, what he identifies as the first cause here, first just in, in order, not first as in preceding all the other causes, is what we can call by convention the formal cause. Now he doesn't actually use the word form at this point in the metaphysics. He actually uses three other Greek locutions and we have translations for them, which we'll talk about in just a moment. One of these is ousia. This is a difficult to translate term because it doesn't always mean exactly the same thing. Even in Aristotle, he will sometimes go back and forth in, in what he means by it. But here you could translate it, as many people do, as essence, as what makes that thing that type of thing. 
getting a little bit more complex. We have this interesting Greek phrase that he uses more than once, toti en enai, and it's difficult to translate this. So, you know, some people say, well, the essential nature, but that's not even close to what the Greek is saying. Quite literally, it's what it was to be. Uh, the ain is actually a, a past tense and imperfect. What the, the, the being that it, it, it is or was. So we're identifying something that is central to it, something that is what makes that thing that particular thing. And then he's got another locution, to dia ti. Dia means through or by means of. So that by which something else or something is, and we can translate it as the reason why or uh, that through which, you know, any of those sorts of things. Now you might say, how do you get from that to something that would be a, a form or a structure? Well, later on in the metaphysics, in um, the section where he's actually talking about causes, He'll tell us that this can also mean, um, in addition to the toti and ani, and in, in addition to other things, he says it could be the whole, the whole own. It could also be the composition, the synthesis, or it could also be the form, the eidos. And we'll we'll look at examples of this that'll help us out in just a moment. Correlative to this, we have the material. And here he says the second of these causes is the, in Greek, hule, which originally means something like wood, but then comes up to take a much broader signification as matter in general. The stuff things are made of, right? And a little bit later, he calls this the Hupokemenon, which we translate as subject or substrate, that which underlies that in which things reside. So let's look at these two causes before going on to the other ones. And that will probably be a bit helpful if we consider examples. So we have this piece of chalk and chalk itself is a certain kind of matter, a certain kind of material, a certain kind of hule, right? And, and we know that it's some sort of, you know, calcium, limestone uh, composite. Um, we don't really need to know that as far as Aristotle's concerned, although it would be nice to know what, what precisely it's made of. And the chalk, as a piece of chalk, has a certain form, does it not? It's cylindrical. I write on the board with it because of its shape. It was a big chunk or something. It would be less wieldy for me to write on the board with. So it has a form or structure and it has the material that it's made of. This is a thing. Likewise, let's consider my tie. My tie is made of cloth. And here it gets a little bit more complicated because uh, you notice it's got different colors, right? Those different colors come from different dyes, uh, different threads that have been woven together in, in other manners. Just pretend for a moment that it's a single uniform gray tie. So we have gray cloth. I'm not sure if this is, so this is 100% silk. So it's made from uh, silk, uh, spun in certain ways. That's the material of it. And then... The cloth itself is the material is put into a certain structure, a certain shape that we call a tie. Could have been used to make a handkerchief. It could have been used to make uh, one of those cloths. I don't know if I, I do. Yeah, I do in fact have it in my pocket that we clean our glasses with. Let's say this is made out of silk or something like that, right? And this way you can ball up in different ways than you can with this. Again, an object it's got a structure, it's got a form that allows us to identify it as that kind of object and it's made out of something. We can get to quite complex uh, types of organiz organized holes when we think about something like a book, right? 
this binding and cloth and paper and all of these marks. And Aristotle actually considers something like a, a, a word. A word is a certain form that's composed of letters or syllables or however you want to frame it. So those are the first two causes. Now, Aristotle says that's not enough to actually understand the totality of the thing why it is the way it is, how it came to be. And the other two causes that he brings in, he talks about as opposed to each other, or at least set at opposite ends. So the first of these is what we call the efficient cause. And the efficient cause is what brings that thing into being or produces it or introduces that shape to it or sets it in motion. And he has a lot of really interesting examples. Let's use one that'll be particularly helpful that brings in the formal and material cause. So if we think about one of the instances that he brings up over and over again, the bronze statue, we have a statue, it's made of the metal bronze. It has a certain shape that allows you to identify it as a statue and perhaps even this kind of statue. There were a lot of stereotypical statues of, you know, gods or people doing this or that. So you look at it and you're like, aha, that's a young man pouring water statue made out of bronze. How did that come to be? There was some statue maker who produced the statue, the bronze worker. And Aristotle even goes a little bit further. He says, how did the bronze worker do that? Did he just pop in there and start suddenly fabricating it? No, he had to have a certain skill, a certain art of bronze working. And that is also an efficient cause of him, in fact, being an efficient cause. Here we're getting a little bit complex. So let's actually drop that for just a moment. And it's enough to notice that there's something that if we have a form imposed on matter, something that could impose that form or produce it. Aristotle has another really interesting example in the physics where he says that the person who gave counsel is also an efficient or moving cause. And he, he calls this the arche tes kineseos, the source of the motion or change. One of Aristotle's great contributions to metaphysics, in his view, is noting that there's another kind of cause and he calls this a final cause. This he labels in a number of different ways. He calls it huhenica, which we can translate as purpose, literally on that on account of which, or that because of which, or for which, tagathon, the good, or telos, the word we get teleology from, if you're familiar with that term, which means end, or purpose, or goal. And things in Aristotle's view have final causes. In fact, he says that this is one of the most important of the causes because without a final cause, the efficient cause isn't going to do what it's going to do. And the final cause is what you could say motivates all these other causes. And he will give lots of examples of this. We could think about the statuary. Why does the person actually make the statue? Maybe their final cause is to make a buck, to feed their family. Or it could be that they really love making statues. We could also think of, well, why does the person writing the words, why do they set all those down? Could be to communicate knowledge. And Aristotle thinks that there are many things that are not man-made or fabricated, but are natural. And those have final causes as well. The final cause for some things could be to continue their existence, to produce new versions of themselves, to spread out and, and take up an important role within an ecosystem. Of course, this is going beyond Aristotle's views on the interrelations between animals and plants, but we could well imagine that sort of thing. Now, all of these causes 
function together. You don't have them operating in a pure vacuum, like a final cause just by itself sitting out there unconnected to all these other things, an efficient, a formal, and a material cause. Likewise, material causes don't explain that much on their own, nor do formal causes, nor do efficient causes. And Aristotle thinks that metaphysics, if it's going to do its job well, has to take account of and try to understand all four of these within a sort of nexus.